G'day, gymnastic skill seekers. Welcome back to another video, another post, another conversation about program design. So last week I posted a video about how to apply the 54321 strength training method to gymnastic strength training. And off the back of that, there was a comment or a question asking about how to program flexibility training around strength training. And to be honest, there isn't really a simple answer to this, but I can definitely share some insight into some of the things we must consider when we're building a program that contains not only strength, not only flexibility, but also skill work, which is common for you know gymnastic skill seekers. Now, the number of training goals you have, your flexibility levels, your strength levels, your lifestyle factors, all these things, they all play a key role in program design. And that's why there's not really a one size fits all best approach to training. Yes, we can follow a team program or we can follow a training template and make progress, but that progress isn't going to be as efficient or as effective as a tailored program designed specifically for your current level of abilities and I suppose needs. Let's say for example, for me right now, I'm training four days a week and I'm mixing in flexibility, strength training and skill work and that leaves me with three full rest days. In each session, I'm actually combining strength, flexibility, and skill work. So they're all in each session. However, this approach doesn't work for everybody. I've got clients that I work with online who prefer to separate their flexibility um, and do that on different days to their strength and skill work. And that's fine. Both ways work, and we just need to figure out you know, what works best for us and how we can fit it into you know, our busy schedules. Some of the things to consider when designing a program is obviously your individual training goals, injury prevention, recovery, the time or the schedule that you have, your training history, and a little bit around assessment, okay? Where are you right now? What are the things you need to work on that are gonna help you progress with your flexibility, strength, or skill, whatever the goal is you're working towards? So they're the things I wanna talk about in this video. Whenever I start working with a new client, these are the things that we initially sit down and talk about in the first call that we have. So let's walk through these and talk about these in a little bit more detail. Training goals and priorities. So what are you training for? What are your goals? Now setting goals like I wanna get strong or I wanna increase flexibility are really not good enough. We wanna set specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timely goals. The more specific you can be, the better. Research shows that people who set SMART goals are far more likely to stick to the plan and succeed on their goals. I found that you know, having goals gives me a sense of direction and it gives me purpose behind my training. So an example of this could be you know, back in the day when I was focusing more on strength, I could do a straddle press to handstand, but it wasn't pretty. It was more of like a forward leaning planche with bent knees and it was quite ugly. Yeah, I could get the press, but I wasn't happy with it. Now, no amount of strength training was going to help me improve the aesthetics of my press to handstand. I needed to increase my flexibility. So there's purpose behind that. I need to get better at my pancake, get better at my flexibility so that I can improve the aesthetics of my press to handstand. Now, this got me thinking, well, if I don't have the flexibility to make this look good, well, there's got to be a lot of other gymnastics movements that I'm trying to work towards that would benefit from me dedicating more time to flexibility. Flexibility was the limitation. It was holding me back from a number of my gymnastic strength goals. So I learned to prioritize flexibility and I'll talk more about that further in this post. So I switched up my training and I set myself flexibility goals and I put them as the priority behind the goals. I had a reason why I wanted to get flexible. One of the big problems we see, not only in the gymnastic strength training world, but I think it's across the fitness industry, is people have a long list of goals and they also have this fear of missing out, this FOMO. They wanna train everything at once. And I get it, I've made that mistake before. But the truth is, it's impossible to train everything at once and expect to see significant progress. Yes, you can make small amounts of progress when you're training everything at once, but that progress is going to be nowhere near as much as if, as if you were focusing in on you know, certain priorities or certain goals that you really want to succeed in. 
That's why it's important to prioritize your goals and get the most out of your training. What's really important to you? What do you want to accomplish in your training? And it can be hard. You're going to have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to be very specific about what you have time to achieve, okay? So how many goals can you have? Well, again, this comes down to, well, how much time do you have available and how long does it take to train for that specific goal? So two to three goals within each category of strength, flexibility, and training is probably the maximum I would aim for. So as an example, let's talk about strength and flexibility goals. Most people can make good progress by training these goals once, maybe twice per week. We don't really need to put in a lot of frequency and volume to make progress with strength and flexibility. So if I've got the goal of adding 10 kilos to my pull-up, I could train weighted pull-ups once a week and make progress towards that goal. If I've got the goal of increasing my flexibility and working towards my chest to floor, floor pancake, then training that once, maybe twice a week, I'm going to make progress with this. Skill work can be a little bit different. As an example, let's say you want to learn to handstand. If you've never done handstands before, it's possibly going to take you three, four, possibly even five times a week that you're going to need to be dedicating to handstand training. So you can see depending on the goals you have and the requirements behind those goals, how you're going to be able to fit this into your busy week. The other thing we want to be a little bit careful about is the demand on the central nervous system. So both strength and flexibility goals place a higher demand on the central nervous system than let's say a skill goal. And that's partly the reason why we have to train the strength and flexibility a little bit less. The frequency of training these is less per week than the frequency we can have of skill training. Now this can be very individual because different people can handle different volumes, frequencies and intensities of training. Someone in their early 20s who's living at home with their parents, who's doing some university study, who doesn't really have too much stress in their life can dedicate more time to training and probably recover from higher volumes and higher intensity levels and higher frequency levels. Someone in their 30s who's got kids, who's got a family, who has a full-time job, is feeling quite stressed. Maybe they're not eating properly and sleeping properly. There's a lot of stress going on in their life. They're not going to be able to handle as much intensity, volume, and frequency. So again, it's a very individual thing that you need to sort of play around with to understand you know, what you can handle and what you can fit into you know, your lifestyle. The last thing I want to touch on is gaining and maintaining strength, flexibility, and skill. They're two very different things. Now, world-renowned strength coach Charles Poliquin used to say, it takes six times longer to gain than it does to maintain. So an example of this could be if I'm working towards increasing my strict pull-up strength, that I might do six sets of weighted pull-ups for the week. Whereas if I'm trying to maintain my pull-up strength, Maybe I'd only do one set of weighted pull-ups per week. So the volume and intensity and frequency can be quite different there. So this means that we can have certain goals that we're working towards in this current phase of training or over you know, a sort of three-month period, and then we can have certain goals that we're just trying to maintain over this phase of training or over this three, six-month period, whatever it is. Now, once you've decided what your goals are and you've put them into a list of priorities and you've pulled out the two or three that you're going to train in each category, then you need to also be thinking about, I need to make a commitment to these goals for at least 12 to 18 weeks. Okay, You don't want to be changing goals every other phase because you're going to see minimal progress. 12 to 18 weeks is the minimum amount of time you want to dedicate to training a specific goal because that's what it takes to actually see adaption and changes in the body. Constantly varied training equals constantly varied results. Let's try to stick to the program, stick to the plan, stick to your goals and make a commitment for you know three to six months that you're going to try to work towards these goals. Now, it doesn't mean you're stuck on just these two to three goals. Like I said, there's times where you might change these out and you might put them on maintenance and then bring a new goal in that you want to make gains on. So this is all part of program design and it all comes back to goals and priorities. Okay, the next topic I want to touch on is injury and pain. Now, it might seem obvious, but I really want to bring it into the conversation because I know a lot of people try to push through pain or push through injury and keep working towards their goals, which I'm going to say is just stupid. 
if you have pain and you have injury, you need to put some of your goals on hold and you need to prioritize rehabilitation, fixing the pain or fixing the injury. If you don't do this, then over time, the whispers are going to become screams. And what I mean by that is it's going to become so painful or you're going to injure yourself so badly that you're not going to be able to continue training for your goals. It could take months, if not years, to rehab a really bad injury. But if we step back and we prioritize the rehabilitation, this could take you know two to three months and then you'll be able to get back to training your goals and prioritize your strength, flexibility and skill work again. So do not push through pain. That is just stupid. There's a great quote by Oliver Goldsmith that says, he who fights and runs away may live to fight another day, but he who is battled slain can never rise and fight again, which are very wise words. And they lead nicely into the next topic, which is recovery. Recovery. Yeah, it's a very uh, touchy topic in the fitness industry. There, there are sort of two groups. There are the people that believe in overtraining and then the people that don't believe in overtraining. But to me, it just doesn't make sense to continually be training and not allowing the body to rest and recover. Training is a physical stress that we place on the body. It's catabolic. It breaks down cells. It causes damage. Rest and recovery is anabolic. It gives the body the chance to rebuild, to recover, to grow, to adapt, to get stronger, to get fitter, to become more flexible. Everything that we're working towards happens in the state of recovery. We apply a stress, training is a stress, and then we rest and allow the body to adapt. So it's important to make time in your training schedule for recovery. Inadequate recovery leads to physical breakdown. This could be in the form of injury, burnout, adrenal fatigue, hormonal imbalance, and so much more. It's just not worth it. Listen to the whispers before you hear the screams. Chances are if you're not making progress, you don't need to do more. You probably need to do less. I think far too many people are training too hard and they're not allowing their bodies to recover. Again, I talked about the example above. It depends on who you are, what other stressful factors you've got going on in your lifestyle. All these lifestyle factors contribute to how hard you can train and how fast you recover. Recovery involves managing the central nervous system, and this can depend on the type of training you're doing. When the intensity goes up and we start to lift heavier weights, then this places a bigger demand on the nervous system. Strength and flexibility training places a bigger demand on the central nervous system. If we're doing more sort of hypertrophy training where the volume is high, then we can potentially add more frequency because it's not so demanding on the nervous system. It's not just a simple thing where we can go, hey, I'm feeling good, I can train again. I'm not sore, I can train right now. You know, DOMS is a sign that we've caused muscle damage. Now, the muscle heals a lot faster than the nervous system. It takes six times longer for the nervous system to recover than it does for the muscular system to recover. That's why when we're doing sort of heavy strength training, we take longer rest periods between sets to allow the nervous system to recover before we go back and we lift the heavy weight again. Hypertrophy training, we're causing muscle damage. We don't need as much time because we're lifting lighter weights for more volumes of repetitions to allow the muscle to recover. So the type of training we're doing has an impact there. Now, if you wanna learn more about stress, the impacts that training has on the central nervous system and how to balance maybe sympathetic and parasympathetic activities to speed up recovery, then I recommend you check out the work of Joel Jamison. He's over at eightweeksout.com. And you can learn a lot more about, you know, recovery over there. You know, he's a big fan of HRV. Um, You know, he uses a a strap to measure HRV with a lot of his athletes. And he'll talk about, you know, different HRV scores, what it actually means. You know, if you've got an aura ring or something like that, it's something that you can track and you can measure. And it helps you get a better perspective of, you know, how training might impact you, how a lack of sleep, how certain foods, lots of things can impact you. And obviously, you know, what your recovery is like, when and where you can fit training around maybe your busy life. Recovery is important and we need to sit down and consider it when we're designing a program. Eat, sleep, train, recover, repeat.
Now, the next thing we want to consider is, well, the training schedule. Where and when can you train during the week? Now, this is important. The more time you have available to train, potentially the more goals you could train for. But if your training time is very limited, short windows or short opportunities and infrequently throughout the week, then you might not be able to train for as many goals. So you're going to have to make sacrifices. And again, this comes back to depending on the individual goal. Is it a strength and flexibility goal that we only need to train one or two times a week? Or is it a skill goal that we need to train multiple times a week to see progress on? Is this goal that you've set yourself a, really a priority? If I tell you that handstands is requiring three to five times a week that you're going to train it, can you fit that into your training schedule and still do the other goals that you want? Maybe once you realize the demand of handstand training, it won't become such a priority. You know what? I can't commit that much time to handstand training, so I'm going to drop it off my list of priorities and it's going to allow me to include more flexibility and strength goals as an example. So sit down, figure out your training schedule because this has a huge role to play in program design. So number five, I think we're up to number five, it's training history and assessment. How long have you been training for? How long have you been training for these specific goals? What training styles have you been using? What's been working? What hasn't been working? How often are you training? What volumes? What intensity? What frequency? We can learn a lot from a client's training history, and this is going to help us better understand what to include and how to design the program moving forward. For example, before training with me, a lot of my online gymnastic skill seekers had been following a high volume and high frequency training program for far too long. The reason they'd stop seeing progress is because they were doing too much volume and they weren't getting enough rest. We changed the program up, we increased the intensity, we lower the volume and they unlock new skills that they've never achieved before because we've just changed up the training program. And we've done this because we understand, okay, what has the client been doing and what's not working? What do we need to change and what's going to help them see the progress moving forward? Also, a lot of adults that I work with want to increase their flexibility, but they've never really dedicated any time to flexibility training. Yeah, they've done a few mobility drills in their warm-up, and maybe they've done some static stretching at the end of their training, but they've never dedicated chunks of their training just to flexibility training. And we can see that in their training history, and then we can talk to them about their goals and what they want to accomplish. And if they want to prioritize flexibility, we have to dedicate actual training time to flexibility training. So that's one part of the assessment, understanding training history. Another part of the assessment is okay, a physical assessment. Where are you now with your goals? If you want to accomplish something like a chest to floor pancake, well then where are you right now? Let's test that chest to floor pancake. Let's set a milestone. This is the starting point. This is where I'm at. Okay, and then we want about to see progress. So we're assessing that. Strength is the same. If you want to add 10 kilos, let's say, to your 1RM pull-up, well, then what's your 1RM pull-up right now? I don't want to know what your 1RM pull-up was six months ago or last year. We're going to assess right now what is your 1RM pull-up, and then we're going to design a program that's going to allow you to add 10 kilos to that 1RM pull-up. Skill training is a little bit different. So if we're working towards skills, yes, we want to assess the skill. If you want to do a press to handstand, well, let's have a go. Show me where are you right now with your press to handstand. But we also want to look at, well, what flexibility and strength demands are required to accomplish that skill? So in the press to handstand example, well, what is your pancake flexibility like? What is your overhead press strength like? We can test these so we can start to see, well, what is the missing or the limiting factor that's stopping you from improving that skill or unlocking that skill? Is it flexibility related? Is it strength related? And then we can try to prioritize that limitation in the next training phase as we design the program. We increase the strength if that's what's missing and then you unlock the press to handstand. We increase the flexibility if that's what's missing and then we improve your press to handstand. So once we have a good understanding of your training history and we've done a physical assessment, this allows us to design the next training phase. 
Now, this could be a four to six week training phase, depending on the coach, depending on who you are, all these different factors come into play with how long the training phase lasts for. But it doesn't really matter. At the end of that training phase, in the final week, we're gonna reassess. We're gonna look at the drills you're currently working on right now, and we're gonna see, okay, have you made progress with that? Is this still the limitation, or do we need to start to think about what else is stopping you from building strength, improving flexibility, or unlocking your skill? Do we need to change the program? If you're not making progress, then we need to revisit the program and figure out if the intensity, volume, or frequency is too high, or if we're following you know, the right program tailored for you. If you are making progress, then do we need to make changes? If things are going well, then we can stick to the current program or we might make small changes to the current program. Maybe you're making changes and the changes have started to slow down. In the first few weeks, you're making really good progress and then the last few weeks, you haven't been seeing as much progress. Then it might be time to change a few of the exercises, adapt the training program, work on something slightly different. We don't add variety just for the sake of adding variety. I said it before, a constantly varied training program delivers constantly varied results. Find out what's working and then try to stick with it. Make small changes when changes are due by reassessing and looking at the progress that you're making. Step by step, you're going to be able to continue to work towards your goal if you pay attention to what is working and what is not working, which is obviously a part of successful program design. Okay, so now we get to program design. Only after you've done the first five steps should you get to this point. And if you've done the first five steps, the program nearly writes itself. It's simply a matter of placing your training goals into your schedule, okay? But there are some key program design principles that I want you to consider when you do this. Number one is to train the highest priority goal at the start of the session. Now, there's a lot of misinformation and misconception in the fitness industry around program design, specifically when we start to talk about training different styles of things. We can't put flexibility and strength together. You can't do skill after this. You can't do this. You can't do this. Rah, 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 you shouldn't do this. My suggestion is organize your program in order of your priorities. Whatever the priority is, it should be at the start of each session. If you're prioritizing flexibility, then flexibility needs to go at the start of each session. If you're prioritizing strength, then strength should go at the start of each session. The fact is, whatever you train first is going to be the thing that you make the most progress on, okay? And that's an important thing to think about. What are your goals? What are your priorities? I'm gonna put them first in the training session. An example of this is when I decided that I wanted to increase my flexibility, I put flexibility training at the start of each of my sessions. I needed to get flexible so that I could get better at my gymnastic strength training. The strength stuff became second, skill stuff became third, but every session for me started with flexibility and I'd combine flexibility, strength and skill all in the same session and that's what worked for me. Now you might not want to put all of those into one session, maybe you want to keep it separate. So maybe on a Monday you will train the priority, flexibility, it's a pure flexibility day. On Tuesday maybe you're doing strength and skill work, on Wednesday it's possibly a rest day, on Thursday you could bring back flexibility work if that's the priority. I've had a rest day on Wednesday, so I'm coming back to the gym the most recovered, the most focused, the most hopefully refreshed. So again, I put the priority on that day. So again, it depends on your training schedule and how you structure this, but my advice is to prioritize your number one goals at the start of each session. Now, one caveat to this might be skill training, okay? And the reason I say that is because skill requires both strength and flexibility. What's the limitation that's holding you back from performing the skill the way you want the skill to look and feel? If flexibility is the biggest limitation, then put flexibility first, then train the skill. If strength is the biggest limitation, then put strength first and then train the skill. We want to make sure we're working on the right element or the right component of the skill and bringing that up so that we get overall improvements in the skill. So when might you put skill first? Well, if you are happy with how the skill looks and feels and you're just trying to improve consistency or increase the endurance of the skill, then you would put the skill at the start of the training session. Now I'm gonna say skill training doesn't place the same demands on the central nervous system. And that's partly why we can train skill 
at a higher frequency. Back to the handstand example. If you want to learn to handstand, handstand three, four, five times a week, and we can do that because the, the stress on the nervous system is a lot lower compared to strength and flexibility work. So we've got to take this into consideration as well. There's a lot of neurological demands being placed on the nervous system when we're training strength and flexibility stuff. So how we order that and how we place that is important. We want to put the most demanding stuff at the start of the session as well. And that's why skill often comes later in the session because it's just not as demanding on the nervous system. So just to recap, you want to put the highest priority stuff at the start of the session, but you also want to take into consideration the neurological demand of the exercise and start the session with the most demanding exercises. Flexibility and strength often go first because they require more energy, more strength, more focus. Okay, number two, we don't train high volume and high intensity simultaneously. It's not effective to be doing this. It confuses the muscle. What's the goal of this training phase? Are you trying to build strength, increase flexibility? Are you trying to lose weight? Are you trying to learn a new skill? Are you trying to build lean muscle mass? Are you trying to improve fitness or endurance? What are you trying to work on and what should be the priority here? Is it more volume, more frequency, or is it less volume, less frequency, higher intensity? Intensity and volume are opposites, okay? There's an inverse relationship. As intensity goes up, volume must come down. And you must pay attention to this because if you don't, it's only going to lead to burnout, what we discussed before. This is where cycling between phases of accumulation, high volume, high frequency, and phases of intensification, low volume, low frequency, higher intensity, is a great way to manage volume and intensity. So that's something you can look into around program design and get a better understanding of how you might periodize your program over six months, 12 months, two years, even longer. That depends on how much you want to sit down and, and plan the program design. Okay, number three is don't train more than two days in a row. It's important to note that training more than two consecutive days in a row is going to slow down your progress. You might initially see good progress, but over time, it's going to decrease. Trust me, it's going to decrease. What is the minimum dose response? Remember, we're trying to figure out what's the least amount of training we can do so you see results. It's not worth wasting time and energy on training that hinders your progress. If you've done two days back to back, chances are you're going to need a rest day. Remember, training is catabolic, rest is anabolic. We need time to recover. If you're struggling to see progress, chances are you're training too much. Number four is don't put lower body flexibility on the day after a heavy leg session or a heavy lower body strength session. This should be pretty obvious. If you're going to do heavy legs, chances are you're going to be sore the next day. You're going to have DOMS. It's not going to be easy to stretch a tight muscle, okay? So it's best to either follow up a heavy legs day with upper body training or to follow up a heavy legs day with a rest day, something we want to consider. Now, you can combine lower body strength and lower body flexibility together. Now, if you're going to do that, I'd suggest you put the strength stuff first and then the flexibility stuff after that. But both of these are going to be placing a high demand on the CNS. So it's got to be, you've got to be careful with this. Are you the type of person that can manage this? Can you handle that amount of stress in one session? If so, go for it. If not, then you probably don't want to combine heavy legs and flexibility on the same day. It's okay to combine you know, heavy upper body training and flexibility. The upper body recovers a little bit faster. The muscles are smaller in the upper body. You know, We generally lift, lift less weight with our upper body compared to our lower body exercises. Our lower body muscles are much bigger. So the demand there is a lot higher Okay, when we're doing lower body flexibility and strength work. The other thing I want to say here is flexibility training is a form of hypertrophy training. Often when we're performing static or dynamic stretches, we're spending 60 plus seconds of time under tension in that you know, mobility or flexibility exercise. This is in the range of hypertrophy training. 
This is causing muscle, muscle damage. It's breaking down muscle tissue. It's changing the structure of our muscle tissue, our connective tissue. So therefore, it takes a certain amount of time to recover from that. If we're performing our stretching sessions properly, we're going to have DOMS after our stretching sessions. So we need to treat you know, flexibility the same way as we would treat more sort of hypertrophic training. So that's why if you're going to do a heavy leg session, you know, it's going to be central nervous system stuff first. What's the more taxing? Lifting heavy weights is more taxing than doing, you know, the stretching and the flexibility stuff. So you've got to be aware of that and think about how you structure, you know, your strength and flexibility around each other in the program design. Number five is don't be afraid to experiment. Ultimately, there is no such thing as the best program. There are some general rules about program design, but most of the time, you just need to do the work. Consistency is king. You've got to get in there. You've got to find out the frequency, volume, and intensity that works for you, and then you've just got to be consistent consistent at it, making sure you're getting to the gym, making sure you're getting your workouts in, and just sticking to the plan. You, you want to play around with this plan. You want to experiment with different styles and different formats and find out what works best for you. Can you combine strength, skill, and flexibility all on the same day, or are you better off separating it? You need to figure out what works for you as an individual. My only advice is stick to one style or one format for at least 12 to 18 weeks, because that's the minimum amount of time it takes for your body to adapt and get used to this. In the beginning, when you change things up, yeah, it's a new stress. You're going to feel sore. You're going to feel stiff. You're going to feel tired. But you need time and consistency at this program so the body can adapt, get stronger, and for you to get an understanding of, hey, does this style or this format work for me? Okay? Choose a format. Stick with it 12 to 18 weeks. Okay, the last little point I want to make is have fun. You know, training should be something that you enjoy and something you look forward to. Everyone has their preference. Some people like to go to the gym and do high-intensity workouts. Other people hate it, and that's fine. Personally, I like to focus on building strength, improving my flexibility, and unlocking new gymnastic skills. Other people might find that boring. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of commitment. So this style of training is not for everyone. Over the years, my training has changed. How I trained in my 20s and 30s is very different to how I train now in my 40s. I expect that when I get to my 50s and 60s, training will be different again. Okay, so it's always growing. It's always changing. We're not just sticking to one routine and one format. Okay, we want to continue to progress. Find what workouts make you happy. Find what you enjoy in terms of your training and go to work. Do it. It might be what you want to do now. In 10 years, that might change. Anyway, I hope you found this post interesting and it's given you more confidence to think about how you might combine strength, flexibility and skill training into your own program. If you've got any questions, let me know. If you're still feeling confused around program design, the best thing I can say is hire a coach, okay? Someone to help you with this program design. One of my best investments over the years was hiring, is hiring coaches to write my program. I still work with coaches now who help me write my program. It allows me to learn from others, okay? I gain experience, I gain knowledge, and it, help, it holds me accountable. Yes, I can write my own program, but I just find that investing in a coach is something that has always helped me make more progress and see better results. So if you're having trouble figuring out your training program, you can save a lot of time and a lot of frustration by hiring someone who has the expertise to help you. Okay, so don't sit there and struggle with it. Invest in a coach, learn from them, and potentially, you know, you can take that information away, adapt it, and you know, write your own program in the future. It's a worthwhile investment, one that you will not regret. Anyway, until next time, happy training.